that's right. We're right here at Sharp Facets Gallery on the 72 Bypass. Yes, it's time for Meet Me at the Diner. I tell you what, the political arena is heating up. That's right. Gosh, we got just a little over 30 days till Election Day. And, of course, tomorrow night's the big debate on TV for our uh, presidential candidates. But on the local level... We are right here at WCRF doing our part to make sure that everybody who tunes in can be educated and make a good decision when you go into that voting booth. And today our very special guest is Jennings Maccabee. He is running for our state Dis Senate District 10. How are you doing today, Jennings? I'm doing great on a beautiful day. It is a. Be it turned out to be a beautiful oh, day. Gorgeous. Gorgeous. So uh, you, of course, uh, made it through the whole... Uh, issues that we've had through the primary and getting everybody. You, of course, were registered in uh, McCormick. That's you, correct. You were outside all of that. So uh, how has the campaign been going so far? Well, I think it's been going well. I spent an awful lot of time on the road, meeting groups, uh, talking with groups, and uh, doing some one-on-one, uh, you know, knocking on doors even. Uh, so it's been, it's been great. I met a lot of good people, got a lot of good ideas from folks about, you know, where we need to go, what we need to do, and that's always a good thing. Absolutely. Well, of course, you were in the House for, what, over 20 years? 23 years. 23 years. Mm -hmm. And then you get out, and now you want to get back in. Can you tell us why you want to get back in? Well, you know, when you do something for more than half your life, you... Uh, you, you have a love for it. You have to have a love for it. And Are you only 40-some? No, that was, <laughs> that, that was back when. Uh, you know, I've been out for 12 years. Okay. So I looked at the numbers on it, and I see a tremendous need in Columbia. There are a lot of things that are going on in Columbia that I have some, you know, concerns about. I have concerns that jobs are not being uh, brought into this area. And as many people know, I brought over 3,000 jobs into the Greenwood and McCormick area when I was in the house. And I just think we could do more to make this area, you know, more uh, presentable to industries uh, outside of South Carolina and maybe even in South Carolina to bring some jobs in here. And of course, we also have to have an educated workforce, you know, technical education, vocational education, those kinds of things in order to meet uh, that demand and, and make industries see that we have a quality workforce here. And of course when you have those two factors you get economic development and when that comes that increases the tax base and you've got the potential there to reduce taxes on everybody else when that happens. Well, you know, we keep hearing, Jennings, that after the first of the year unless some things are done our, all of our taxes are going to be going way up. Oh, it's frightening. Uh, I saw the numbers on that uh, just recently, and you know all of those things that Washington uh, put in with a timetable for it to phase out or coming home to roost uh, January the first, and it, it's going to be incredibly hard on not only the very wealthy people, but you know the average Joe out here on the street. His taxes are probably going up three hundred to three hundred and fifty dollars. And, and that was low income. That, that was low income, low income people. Right. Well, I call that the average show. And yeah. that's, <laughs> that's the folks I like to represent because, you know, I've always looked out for the little people. And it, it bothers me tremendously that the little people are going to get caught in this squeeze, as are middle income people. And uh, it's, it's unfair. They should have made it permanent to start with, but they didn't, and we'll have to deal with whatever happens. But. I'm hoping we'll get some good people in Washington uh, that will look at that matter carefully and do the right thing. Well, here's what I think is interesting, Jennings, just since we're off on the national end, we're not on the local end right at this moment, but on the national end, I heard President, former President Clinton saying that, after, that the reason nothing has happened in a whole year is because there was this big election coming up in November. So after the election, this is what President, former President Clinton said, they will sit down and get serious about this. I find that appalling, that we have spent a whole year wrangling about sequestration and all these budget issues, and this is what the man said, and gosh darn it, if it's true, 
that I'm going to be really upset that we've wasted a whole year of our lives. Oh, absolutely. And, and you know, you have to consider the source. <laughs> uh, President Clinton has a, has a little difficult time dealing with the truth, uh, as we've seen in his escapades in, in years gone by. But, you know, I don't believe it can be done in three months, and, I, and that's the concern that I have. Well, isn't it scary that a lame duck would be doing this? Oh, sure. No yeah. question about it. They Absolutely. Don't, they don't have anything to lose. And, you know, that's another frightening thing about it. When you put that with the gridlock that's been going on in Washington, you know, the Republicans go in one room, the Democrats go in another room, they both come back out and both vote against each other. Nothing ever gets done. And uh, that's, that's a real problem. Absolutely. Now, in South Carolina, in the Senate and in the House, how do you feel they have uh, worked and played together? Well, uh, it's been kind of the same, really. Um, and back when I was in the House, uh, you know, we, we reached across the aisle and worked together. Uh, I remember one bill in particular where DSS was running a $15 million deficit. And I got 103 co-sponsors on a bill to reorganize the whole department, do away with some of the boards that they had, and resolve that $15 million deficit. Now that's 102, 103 members out of 124. I don't know if that's possible today. And what you have to do today is deal with a majority. And we pretty much have a majority Republican in the House and a majority Republican in the Senate. So if you're really going to get anything done, you almost have to be a Republican in order to do it. And we have a Republican governor. Absolutely. So uh, there there you go. Now, I did, uh, at the Democratic Convention, had a conversation with uh, Senator Vincent Shaheen. And he told me he likes to have, when he sponsors a bill, he likes to have a Republican and a Democratic. He feels that the more possibilities of getting things done, working together on that. Well, I don't, I don't think there's any question about that. but. You know, it's the majority uh, rules, and and when you have the factions and and the partisanship that's grown so much over the last ten years, it makes it very difficult to get to get that kind of working together. You know, one of the things that I, I like to think about is that pol people that are elected to political office are supposed to do what's best for their what their constituents want. And we seem to have, in some aspects, gotten a little away from that. It seems to be more what the party wants rather than the constituents' needs or desires are, are met. Oh, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And, you know, when I first went to Columbia, the people came first. The party, you know, the people back at home was second, and the party was third. Now the reverse of that has happened. The party seems to come first. The people back at home or the state, you know, is second and the people back at home get left out. And that's another reason that I'm running for office. The people are first, and, and we need to keep that in mind and, and work toward that end of doing the people's business and not what's right for the party or what's right for the government. Absolutely. Well, we are here with Jennings Maccabee. He is running for the State Senate District 10. We are going to hear a quick word from our sponsors when we come back. We'll be talking some more with him. He'll be here the whole hour. If you have a question or a comment, don't hesitate to give us a call, 229-7984. That's 229-7984. Don't you? That's right. We're right back here at Sharp Facets Gallery. Yes, I'm Ann Eller. Yes, I'm talking to Jennings Maccabee, talking about a lot of different issues. He is running for State Senate District Number 10. Now, Jennings... What exact area does that cover? Because I know we've had redistricting, so some people that were in District 10, where do they, what does it fall now? Well, basically it's a small portion of McCormick County, most of Abbeville County except for the Hodges, Donalds, uh, Chinkapin, uh, Lodge Ground area, uh, the rest of Greenwood County is in it, two-thirds of Saluda County is in it. Um, it's, it's all the way from Lake Murray to Lake Russell as far as the width. And it goes really from Highway 370. Well, Persimmon Hill Golf Course and Saluda is in it, and so is the town where it shows. That'll give you an idea of the width and breadth. Basically, uh, 
a lot it's of... It's a pretty diverse group, isn't it? Oh, it absolutely is. But, you know, it's this area is really rural. Uh, you, you think that we've got a metropolis here in Greenwood, but we really don't. And when you look at, you know, Charleston and Richland and Greenville counties, uh, they are the areas that are going to control the legislature because the one man, one vote principle has given them uh, extra seats in both the House uh, and the Senate. Mm -hmm. But it, it, it's a group that, that really works together well because a lot of people from Saluda work in Greenwood, a lot of people from McCormick work in Greenwood, and a lot of people from Abbeville work in Greenwood, and people in Greenwood work in Abbeville. So it's, it's pretty much the same. You know, we just need to bring more industry in, uh, and I think I have the background and the proven success uh, to do that. Well, you know, I know one of your issues is education, but, uh, you know, we just saw where, wasn't it, the SAT scores were down some, and um, certain areas have bucked the, bucked, this, bucked the standard for the state, but we're still, education-wise, we are still lagging behind. And, you know, isn't it true if we don't get our kids at an early age and get them reading and getting up to par, it doesn't matter how good the education is at the higher level if they haven't accomplished the basics at the lower level. You're exactly right on that. And I think the answer in those lower levels is possibly smaller class sizes. But last year the General Assembly uh, didn't fund education. As a matter of fact, the funding for education is back at the 95, 96 levels for the Equal Finance Act, which I sponsored and, and got passed to take care of all 92 school districts. But if we don't get the adequate tools in those first grades, you lose that child by the time he gets to middle school, and then he's trying to catch up or either he gets frustrated and drops out of school. We've got to do a better job with that. And I think if the teachers were given the right tools rather than having to fill out paperwork and teach the test rather than how to, how to memorize, you know, the, the textbooks mm -hmm. uh, or be able to get the child focused on learning instead of memorizing, uh, we'd be a lot better off. Well, you see programs all around that are happening all around the country. How about right here in South Carolina? Well, I think we could look at other areas and maybe pick up some good good tools um, there. But are we? Are we? We have not done that in the past. And I think that may be the answer. It, it deserves some study because it frustrated me to see those SAT scores uh, going down that you mentioned a little while ago. We, we've got to do a better job. And I think if the teachers were given the tools and they didn't have all this paperwork uh, and they were adequately uh, paid for the job that they do, that things would improve. Oh, absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more, except I was thinking as a small business person and all the paperwork I have to fill out just to exist as a small business person. <laughs> I, I see some similarities I, there. I have been there. Uh, I've run two or three small businesses and I spent more time signing the front of checks than I did the back <laughs> of checks and believe you me I know about the regulations I've been in communications as you are here and it's unbelievable the amount of paperwork that you have to do and the tests that you have to run to make sure you don't have any signal leakage and and all of those types of things and it's not just in the businesses that we've been in it's been in all small businesses. And well, there seem to be more coming down the pike all the time. This is the other issue to it. It doesn't seem to stop. Oh, I couldn't agree with you more. And, and you know, the small business, he doesn't have the ability to, to skirt the issues like a lot of these large corporations does. He's there every day. Uh, they've got their fingers, they handle on him. Uh, government does. And we've simply got to get government out of small businesses and, and increase the opportunity. That's where most of the jobs in this country are, in small businesses. And if we run them all out of business and we don't have anything left but Walmart and Kmart, then we're going to be in trouble. I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Now, as far as your opponent in this, how do you feel he has done in bringing things to the fore here for Greenwood and McCormick and this area here? Well, I hadn't seen much happen. 
uh, in the last four years. And, you know, I've known the guy that uh, is the director for the Department of Commerce, which all of the, you know, contacts come through that department. I've known him for 30 years, and I haven't seen any results for anybody uh, going down there. We have an economic development team here in Greenwood, and most counties, uh, you know, do have that. But I think you've got to have some political leadership to open those doors. And, you know, I, I just haven't seen any results. Sure, we've had some retail expansion and all of that, but most of the time the retail jobs are lower paying and they don't really uh, help a person support their family. Well, uh, you know, and, and so many of the retailers that are coming here into this area, they do not even give out full-time jobs. Most of them are part-time, so they don't even end up with any benefits out of it. So is it good to have this variety so we can spend our dollars right here in Greenwood so the tax dollars stay here? Yes. Sure. But uh, very few full-time employees in most of these organizations. Well, the reason, I, in my opinion, that they don't have full-time employees is they don't have to pay the benefits for right. them. They don't have to do the insurance. And that's another government mandate coming down the pike from Washington, D.C. And it's going to hurt the average guy out here working because he won't only be able to work 20 hours a week instead of 40 and be a full-time employee. And the more regulations they put on small business, the harder it is for any business to keep and add employees. Sure, and that's what, that's of course what we're looking at uh, a lot on the national election with our, our presidential possibility here. Is it going to be Governor Romney? Is it going to be President Obama? This is the decision that you out there are going to have to make and look at all the issues. You're also looking at your state issues. Now, um, Governor Haley has certainly every week we hear where another new industry is either coming in or expanding. How do you feel Governor Haley has done? Well, I feel like she's done fairly well in, in most of the, you know, recruitment she's done. Boeing, of course, and, and Charleston. I was in the legislature. Um, she, Governor Haley wasn't there at the time when BMW came to South Carolina. As a matter of fact, I did the package, the incentive package, to bring them into South Carolina. The problem, well, thank God that came here. Yeah. <laughs> well, the problem, as I see it, is we're not getting the attention uh, in the Greenwood, Abbeville, Saluda, and McCormick area that some of the other areas in the state uh, have gotten. I mean, well, why is that? Why yeah. is that? Do we have some deficiency that makes us undesirable? Well, I think it, no. I don't think we have deficiencies. I just think our story is not being told, and I don't think our leadership in Columbia has brought that to the attention of the Department of Commerce, and that's one of the things. I'm going to sit on that guy's desk and say, hey, look, I'm not leaving <laughs> until we get some action here. And that's and that's basically what we need. We, can, we can't simply go down there and sit and draw a salary. That's, that's part of the legislative process, in my opinion, is doing things that make this area a wonderful place for jobs, economic development, and opportunity. And, uh, you know, it's more to it than just drawing a salary and sitting there and voting on issues. Absolutely. You know, one of the things that I thought was amazing in the spring, they had the rural um, development group come here, and it was at John Holloway's, and they went up and down the streets of Greenwood and everything. Every person that I talked to who was out of Columbia, the biggest thing they said, I had no idea that Greenwood in this area had this much to offer. Of course, and, and that's exactly what I'm talking about. Our story is the best kept secret, and we don't need to keep it a secret. We need to tell that story and be aggressive about it. I mean, it's, we've got all the, the great assets that we have, our lakes, our natural resources, and all of those, and we need to protect those. But we've got everything that, that we can offer any industry that wanted to come into this area, but we've got to open that door and make that effort, and that's simply not happening. All right. Well, we are here with Jennings Maccabee. If you've got a question, give us a call, 229-7984. We're going to join South Carolina News in Progress. Don't you go away. Um, are you a pirate or a pack rat? Do you have a vacation of a lifetime sitting in the attic? or a college tuition hung on a wall, or is a fabulous retirement hidden in your jewelry box? 
bring those items to Sharp Facets Gallery, we can establish value and buy from you or sell for you. And so ends another chapter at Sharp Facets Gallery. 72 Bypass and on the web, sharpfacets.com. That's right, we're right here at Sharp Facets Gallery, and we have questions coming in this afternoon. Do you have a question for Jennings Maccabee? He's running for State Senate District Number 10, which is a big part of Greenwood right here. And uh, Jennings, let's see. One of the questions that came in, if elected, how will you address the current power base in order to get your ideas across? Well, I think that'll be relatively simple to do, uh, mainly because I'll be in the majority in the House or in the Senate. Um, but I still know a number of those individuals in the House, the older guys, and more than half of the Senate are friends of mine, personal friends of mine. I talk to them on the phone all the time, and, and I'm looking forward to establishing relationships with the new members. I never had any problem when I was in the House, whether I was a Democrat or Independent or a Republican. Yeah, with, you did kind of change there, didn't it, you? It yeah. kind of, it, it kind of, I'm the only legislator ever <laughs> elected on all three ways in South Carolina. But well, that's, that's a distinction. The, you know, <laughs> you know, that, that's what I said. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't favor the party as much as I do the person. And that's the reason people elected me all three ways, because they knew that about me. And uh, I'm going to continue that. And I'll, I won't, believe me, I won't have a problem working across the aisle and working with other people and working within the Republican Party in Columbia. Absolutely. And then we had another question come in, Jennings. Let's see. Have you considered more technology instead of manufacturing as far as jobs? Absolutely. I think we've got to go that route because, as all of us know, with the textile um, opportunities closing here and there, um, we've got to move toward technology and high-tech uh, jobs. Uh, A lot of the manufacturing you know. jobs are high-tech jobs, so anymore well, too, sure. yes. Sure. Yeah. So, uh, you know, the low-tech the low tech jobs are just almost a thing of the past. But what do we do with that person that's 55 or 50 that's out of a job and needs a job and can't find a job and even with going back to school has a problem finding a job? Oh, that's awfully difficult because many of them are, you know, their feelings are hurt, first of all, because they've lost a job that they've worked in for 30 years. And it, it bothers my heart to see the struggles that a lot of these people go through. But we've simply got to bring in jobs that these people can fill. I'd much rather have 10 smaller industries come in that we can put these people in because if one of them closes, it doesn't have the impact. To give you an idea of what we're talking about, Kellen Falls had three textile plants, one Mohawk carpet. The two textile plants have already closed and Mohawk carpet just announced that they're closing. It's 180 jobs there. Absolutely no jobs available in Cowan Falls and the town is just struggling to stay alive but you know we've got to do something about these pockets of unemployment um, in, in the whole district. Saluda is a small county it's it's struggling as well and of course as most of us know here in Greenwood we've got pockets of unemployment uh, in, in certain areas of Greenwood that we need to we need to address, and we'll have to do that by doing some aggressive promotion to make the jobs that we bring in fit the clientele. Absolutely. Now, as far as the, the as far as the clientele, you know, I know Piedmont Tech is out there doing a lot of training and manufacturing, and what is it up in Simpsonville ZF? They're doing a big training program out there, and of course, that is technology manufacturing. Sure. What can we do? At, do you really think, though, that Greenwood is ready? I know in talking to Mark Warner that one of our problems is we're running out of, of facility space to put a, a manufacturing slash technology business. Sure. Well, we, we, maybe we need to look at building some, uh, some speculative uh, housing for industries that we can show them. Uh, but I think, you know, if we really make an effort uh, to bring in opportunities 
that fit the clientele uh, and at the same time increase our technology training at tech uh, so we can attract some of those high tech jobs, then we can, we can be all right. So you feel the jobs are out there, and you feel, I guess, what I'm hearing is that we're not getting our fair share because we're not getting our voices out there loud enough for people to come take a look at Greenwood. That's that's the feeling that I get. And in talking with people, other people are saying that. They're telling me, hey, why not? You know, we're getting jobs in Iva and Star and all those places. Michelin just announced a big thing over there. There's no reason that Greenwood and the areas surrounding Greenwood can't, ha can't have those same opportunities. I mean, I've, I've, I've been there. I know what makes everything work. I know what makes state government work. I have the experienced leadership to make things happen, and I plan to use that. Absolutely. Now, one of the big issues that keeps being put on the table down there and then taken off the table <laughs> is the tax code. I mean, we have uh, tax issues here. One person I sat down with and talked to one day said you can only repair a garden hose so many times. What do you have to say about the tax issue and why hasn't it been addressed? It was supposed to be addressed this last year in the, in the legislature. I, I understand. Um, unfortunately, back in 1975, all of those ratios were put in the state constitution. So in order to make a change in the ratios or some of the other issues with the Title 10, I believe it is, you have to go back to the people after you pass a resolution to put it on the ballot the next we year. We had plenty of time to do that this year. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, uh, what happened? Of course, but you didn't, you didn't have anyone that wanted to step out there and, and, and take a chance politically on, uh, on making some... What do you mean, some, take a chance politically? Well, you know... Most politicians, uh, I, I don't think I'm one of those, but most politicians are not going to want to do anything that jeopardizes their incumbency. Uh, and when you when you change your tax codes, now businesses, most small businesses are on 10 percent or better ratio, but when you change that, you shift that burden to all of the other ratios. But it's something that needs to be addressed because it's tremendous burden on small business to be at that ratio because as as the economy goes up and as government grows and we've got to do something about, about government growth too uh, then it, it increases that burden on small business I, I've been there I know uh, it was a struggle for me every single year to pay those taxes at the end of the year and I'm talking about property taxes you know and people with homes, uh, we were able to give some relief back when I was there of giving $100,000 off the market value on homes. But that's gradually been eaten up uh, through the years, and that probably needs to be looked at again to increase that homestead exemption, uh, you know, on the owner-occupied homes. Because some of these people on fixed incomes are having a hard time, uh, you know, making ends meet buying medicine and food and all of those things. So those issues need to be looked at, and I plan on doing some research on that when I get there, and maybe we can make some changes that makes the burden easier on people. Property tax is probably the worst form of taxation that we have because it, it penalizes the homeowners, it penalizes the small business, it penalizes big business because when they have to pay huge amounts of property tax, they can't hire new people. So we need to look at the whole realm of that and see if we can make adjustments to make it make it better for everyone involved. Absolutely. Well we are here with Jennings Maccabee. We're gonna hear a quick word from our sponsors. We come up come back, we'll be coming up on that last fifteen minutes. So if you've got a question for him, give us a call, two two nine seven nine eight four. That's two two nine seven nine eight four. Give us a call right now. It's time for a word from our sponsors. Yes, I'm Ann Eller. Yes, we'll be. All right. right. Back. We're back here at Sharp Facets Gallery. You know, it's October 2nd. You will be voting on November 6th. Do want to bring this point up 
this Saturday is the very last day to register for the upcoming election. We did talk to County Moody this morning, and you know that she uh, said the office would be open up till 12 o'clock on Saturday. She also told us that if you uh, mail your forms, as long as they're postmarked the 6, you will be able to vote. But we've got people that have moved and this type of thing, and if you haven't registered, Jennings, what do you have to say to people that haven't registered at this late date? You can't complain about who's elected. <laughs> you know, that's for sure. Uh, you know, it, it's a duty, in my opinion, and always has been to elect, to vote, and elect uh, people to these offices because they represent the people. And if you don't vote, uh, then, you know, and they don't suit you later on, you can't complain. That's true. So uh, I've, I've always voted, and I would urge everyone out there, it's so important especially with the way things are uh, right now, both nationally and, and at the local level, to, to participate in the process. You know, they don't use, like they used to, the voter polls to pick juries anymore. They use a combination of driver's licenses and voter polls and several other things to pick juries out. So that old excuse of, well, I don't want to serve on the jury, which is also a civic responsibility, <laughs> You can't use that anymore, so I would urge everyone to go out and vote, and uh, I don't think you'll be sorry. Well, I think that, uh, you know, the thing, uh, we have uh, talked to Chad Kinsella, who is over at Lander in Political Science. He said on Constitution Day they were running some uh, get out to vote and registering voters and everything. I was appalled to hear that we had some college students over there that said they weren't going to register to vote, they didn't want to vote, they didn't want to be part of it. And in this economy, to be able to say, my vote counts, I mean, how many times, particularly on smaller elections, let's say school boards and city and county council, does a few vo votes make the difference in who gets elected? Absolutely. And, and I can tell you from personal experience, Every vote counts. I have won elections by one vote per precinct, and I have lost an election by one vote per precinct. So, ladies and gentlemen out there, let me tell you, one vote does make a difference. Absolutely. So get out there, and if you're not registered, please register. If you've moved or changed in, uh, changed where your residence since the last time you voted, make sure that you contact Connie Moody down there and either go by or you can call, or you can go on the website for Greenwood County SC. So uh, that's one question. Another question that came in, uh, will you be attending any public events where people can learn more about you? Well, gosh, I thought we had taught a lot about you here today, but I know there are other places, too. Yes, there are, and, and I plan to attend every event that, that I'm invited to. The Greenwood Chamber of Commerce is having one at the Little Theater. I believe that's on the 17th uh, of this month at 6 o'clock. I understand the Citizens for Better Government is scheduling one. They hadn't they hadn't locked in on a date as yet. I'll I'll be at that one. The uh, Palmetto Teachers Association is having a candidate forum in Abbeville uh, that next week. Uh, the Saluda Lions Club is having a candidate forum uh, at the American Legion Hut uh, next week. So. Uh, you can rest assured I'll be there, but if you really want to get some background on my candidacy and, and my past history and everything, you can you can check that out on the website. It's J Maccabee. That's M C A B E E dot com. I've got a new website lined up, and uh, I think you'll like it when you look at it. Absolutely, lots of information. He's been around for a good long time, that's right, and he comes from good bones, I guess we could say. You've, uh, your, your grandfather, what? Uh, who, who all was in the legislature before you? Well, it's, it's an interesting history, really. Uh, my grandfather was Martin Gary Dorn. He was a lumber uh, manufacturer down in McCormick, and he was in the state senate. As a matter of fact, he served with his cousin, who was Brian Dorn, uh, back in back in the early 40s, uh, my granddaddy had uh, had his legs amputated and he couldn't really get around that well, so he kind of he kind of dropped out. But uh, actually, my grandfather's brother was also a state senator. His name was Joseph 
Jennings Dorn, and that's where my name came from, Jennings Gary Dorn. So, How about that? I actually talked to somebody who, I, I must have been Brian Dorn, when he went into the Senate, I talked, I went on an honor flight, met a couple of the guys, one guy who had been serving at the same time as Brian was. Brian was uh, just a little shy of being able to be sworn in. They made a, uh, they passed it so he could be sworn in even though he was 24, not quite 25, when he first went in. That's, I thought that was an amazing story. That's correct. Our state constitution requires that you have to be 25 years old to serve in the Senate, and Brian at that time was 24 and a half. And so the Senate judges its own members uh, or their ability to serve, and they had a special vote and seated Brian, and he was seated right next to my grandfather, Martin Gary Dorn, in the, in the back row of the Senate. Back in those days, you had to, when you first came in, you had to sit on the back row. And you worked your way to the front? You worked your way to the front. That's, That's pretty correct. cool. Well, you know, we only have, uh, gosh, we only have five minutes. What particular topic would you like to uh, tackle here in the last five minutes? Well, I think we've got to look at the budget for uh, South Carolina. Of course, our Constitution requires that we have a balanced budget. And about six months ago, it came to my attention that the health and human services uh, area of our state budget was $250 million uh, in the red. Uh, we simply can't continue that deficit financing or we're going to have problems with Standard & Poor's and Moody's uh, in New York. That's the rating companies for our bonds. Uh, we also had a $15 million shortfall in what they estimated the revenues were going to be. And we only funded a small percentage of the money that we borrowed from the federal government to pay our unemployment um, benefits to our citizens back when the economy was so bad. That, in effect, by not fully funding that uh, unemployment compensation loan or funding so we could pay it back, could cause a tax increase on every small business in South Carolina because they're required by law to go up on the taxes to pay for each business to pay that until that fund becomes solvent again. So I have some real concerns about uh, those kinds of issues. Uh, thank goodness we have a balanced budget and we don't have a money machine like Washington does and we can't get, hopefully, uh, you know, in a situation, but there's certain issues that deal with that. I mean, our, our teachers was funded, their their salary increase was funded with non-reoccurring money. Well, that doesn't sound bad, but when yeah, you it is. <laughs> but, well, but when you spend non-reoccurring money on reoccurring items, that means next year. Where is it going to come we, from? We gotta, we, that's right, and we got to come up with twice as much because we. We have to analyze that for the following year before we even consider, a ta or uh, before we even consider a salary increase for the next year. So, those are just some of the issues that I have some real concerns about, and I think we need to need to address those in our state budget process. Well, now I understand there is a gold mine down there in McCormick, isn't it called the Dorn Mine? It is. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any gold in that in that more in that well, mine there? <laughs> well, I, I think there is. Uh, Billy Dorn was a distant relative of mine, and he, it's an interesting story. He, he, dealt with a, a George. I can't remember George's name now, but uh, the the newspaper folks out in in Los Angeles. Uh, at any rate, he dealt with him and didn't own the land uh, to purchase the land. He found the gold on it, and he went back to uh, this guy, and he said, uh, I guess you don't want to sell me the land. You've heard I've discovered gold on it. And he said, no, we shook hands on it, and we agreed on the price, and that's the price it will be. Now, would that happen today no. in today's world? Absolutely but, not. Uh, they operated the mine there through the 1850s, and... Several other companies have come in, uh, you know, after that. You can actually pan for gold in some of the little creeks uh, around the city of McCormick. And uh, 
It's a lot of fun to do it, you know, to find Well, I just wondered if it would help the, help the uh, Treasury down there, if we could find some real gold down there in McCormick. I don't know if we could find enough for the National Treasury. <laughs> the, way, the way that deficit the way is going money. up <laughs> and the way the Congress spends money, it's frightening, you yes. know. And, and the time that one of the conventions went on, it went up by, what, $16 billion? Trillion. 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 It's up to sixteen trillion now. Up to yeah. sixteen trillion, but just in those three days, so, yeah. it went up sixteen billion. And that's uh, I've watched the clock roll over, and we've simply got to stop. We can't spend money we don't have. That's right, you know. And uh, you know, the thing is, it's it's up there, but it rolls down here, doesn't it? For us to have to deal with it from the state all the way down to individuals. Of course it does. I don't know how accurate these numbers are, but I heard the other day, for every man, woman, and child in the United States. The bill for us to repay that is $140,000. That's more than most houses cost. Absolutely. Well, you know, we are here with Jennings Maccabee. He is running for State Senate District Number 10. You know, if you'd like to give him a call, 378-6864. That's 378-6864. And I'm going to give him a minute here just to uh, tell us why we ought to vote for Jennings Maccabee for State Senate District 10. You are listening to WCRS right here in Greenwood. Jennings, why should people vote for you that are in your district? Well, and, you know, I, I think I've outlined most of the points of my platform, and, and I have the experience uh, that I think would be beneficial to this area. And I have proven results in creating jobs and doing things that make the quality of life in this area much better than it is. I've always lived by the theory that you need to leave this place a little bit better than what you found it. But I want to assure everybody out there that I may go to Columbia, but I'll never forget the people who sent me there. And that happens so often, but it will not happen with me. Thanks. That's right. That's Jennings Maccabee running for State Senate District 10. Just a little over 30 days, you'll have to be making up your mind. Again, he's got a new website. What's that website, Jennings? jmaccabee.com. Okay, jmaccabee.com. And, of course, his telephone number, 378-6864. And... You better check him out at all the other different forums. And, Jennings, if you'll get that information back to us, we'll make sure to, that it gets out to all of our listeners so they'll be able to uh, come see you and all the other candidates. Be happy to do that. Thank you very much. This is WCRS right here in Greenwood. I am Ann Eller interviewing tomorrow. Tomorrow, tomorrow is Wednesday. Uh, lunchtime tomorrow. I guess you're going to be over there at the new Republican um, headquarters. headquarters. That's right. Now, where is the new headquarters? New headquarters is right across the street. On, and I don't know if it's Montague, <laughs> Calhoun, or whatever. <laughs> But it's right across the street from Frank's Car Wash in that little row of buildings. Where Jennings, uh, where uh, t Oots and Tinny uh, chiropractor. chiropractor used to be. That's right. So uh, if you would like to, I think it's the office right next door. If mm -hmm. you'd like to be there, that's at 12 o'clock, correct? That's correct. That's right. And then tomorrow afternoon at 4 o'clock, we will have Congressman Jeff Duncan sitting in the hot seat. And then uh, we'll have more guests all week long. And all the candidates will be right here on WCRS right here in Greenwood. Bye-bye, everybody.